On Tech News Today, Xiaomi is now in Apple's part of the smartphone business. Zuckerberg is in Colombia, and the UK Prime Minister is in a delusional state about snooping. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, January 15th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code TNT to get $10 off at checkout. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, and co-anchoring today is NPR technology and culture reporter Elise Hugh. How are you doing, Elise? I'm doing great, Mike. Great to be here again. I'm so glad you're here. You know, something uh, just broke. Some news just broke. Google is not going to continue to produce Google Glass in its current form. They say that they're still committed to the platform, but they're going to focus on future versions of Google Glass, hopefully versions that don't look so dorky. <laughs> I can't say this comes as a huge surprise. Um, back this summer when I was doing the Q&A with Eric Schmidt, uh, he wasn't too excited to uh, engage with any of the crowd members who asked about Glass or uh, wanted hit, wanted to take a picture of him with it and things like that. So I got the feeling that, uh, that the company was eventually going to say goodbye to Glass in its current form uh, before the end of 2015. Are you surprised, Mike? I'm not surprised at all, although it's kind of... You know, it's a misunderstood product, in my opinion, uh, simply because I've been following the kind of um, augmented human cyborg type technology for a long time. It's been uh, under development at MIT and elsewhere for a long, long time. And it was just a few years ago when doing the things that Google Glass can do required a backpack, a helmet, like a massive camera, just like ridiculous amounts of gear. And Google was managed, managed to get it down into the size that we now know it as. And it was a miracle of miniaturization and uh, really interesting technology uh, and elegance. And yet it was perceived as being the very opposite of that. Uh, it was perceived as being clunky and dorky and, and you know, but this is, this is it, at the time that it first started tr uh, uh, trickling out, it was an amazing uh, technology product and, and and quite an achievement. So, well, R.I.P. Current version of Google Glass. We'll see the next version. Yeah, I hope it. I hope it is a lot more sort of built into glasses and and a lot less conspicuous. And they really should come out with a version without a camera. I know that you know the the camera is a big deal and taking pictures is the main thing that people did with Google Glass. But the camera freaks everybody out. And so it might, might be nice. I think it would be more acceptable if you could just have the notifications and just see the screen without actually having a camera pointed at everybody you look at. So uh, just a little bit of advice for Google. Have a, have a cameraless option. That would be really great. Well, let's jump into the news. Elise, Xiaomi launched new products in Beijing today. The products include the 5.7-inch Mi Note smartphone, which CEO Lei Jun was eager to describe as slimmer and lighter than an iPhone. Richard Lai is editor-in-chief for Engadget China and Chinese and has stayed up super late in Beijing to talk to us here today. Welcome to you, Richard. Thanks for having me, Mike. Now, can you tell us more about the Mi Note? What do we need to know about this phone? Um, as you mentioned, it comes with a 5.7-inch screen, a 1080p resolution to begin with, which is which doesn't sound very exciting, but you do get a pro option, which comes with a HD display, which is much sharper and sounds more acceptable for that kind of screen size. And you also get the uh, sort of base model, which comes with a Snapdragon 8 of processor. That's already pretty good because you get a 2.5 gigahertz quad chip. But come uh, end of March, you, you get the more powerful option, which is the Snapdragon 810. Uh, that comes with 8 cores and 64-bit support. Uh, but uh, obviously that'll cost a bit more. Now, the interesting thing about the Mi Note is that, first of all, let's look at the design. It's one of the more... Um, I guess the more one of the more unique designs coming out of Xiaomi, because in the past the company's been 
um, kind of caught red-handed with trying to uh, mimic some of Apple's design languages, so to speak, um, when it, especially when it comes to hardware design and a bit of software design coming from various companies. But this time we're looking at a very, uh, it's a rather nice design. I've actually seen the prototype um, like a little while back and it felt good in the hand. One of the first things that Xiaomi pointed out uh, right in, in uh, back in the keynote was that it's a slightly thinner and slightly lighter device than the iPhone 6 Plus. And on the back, you also get a 13 megapixel uh, image stabilized camera that's actually flush with the body, unlike the iPhone 6 Plus, which was something that um, Xiaomi was able to mock during the keynote. And what's also interesting is that the price point here is a bit above Xiaomi's usual uh, sub 2000 yuan or 320 uh, US dollar price point. We're looking at three hundred and seventy dollars here, uh, which obviously is an off-contract price. But still, I don't think that's going to be an issue for most uh, of the Xiaomi fans in China. I think that's still a very attractive price, especially given the the new design. You've got a uh, gla uh, Gorilla Glass three on both the front and back, and they're both kind of curved, so you get a pretty good looking uh, device here. And I think it will still sell pretty well. But whether they can actually deliver it on time is another a whole different question. But we're looking at a late January delivery for the base model and an end of March for the pro model. Richard, you just mentioned the time question. Why is it a big question um, for Xiaomi to be able to deliver this product on time? Well, Xiaomi has a reputation of, well, first of all, the way they hype their products up is by releasing limited numbers, uh, number of units every time they uh, go on sale. And they say that's because of um, early production rate, which is quite low, which is understandable because, you know, you still have to fine tune the production lines. And it also depends on how many chips and components they can get hold of from their suppliers. And in the past, they've always had a reputation of, you know, teasing the uh, uh, buyers and which therefore causes that kind of chaos when people try and try and jump onto the website to buy them whenever they release a new batch. And um, and I mentioned this specifically because the, the Pro model won't be here until end of March. And we're looking at that new Snapdragon 810 chip, and that's pretty rare at the moment. Um, on, to on the top of my head, I can only think of one phone that has it, which is the LG, um, the, the new Curf version. Uh, that was announced back at CES, and I don't, I'm not, I don't think that'll be out for a while anyway. So, um, when when Xiaomi said end of March, I, I have to be slightly skeptical as to how many units they'll be uh, releasing. I mean, we're, I'm sure we'll be looking at several thousand units, but still, they'll they will go in a matter of seconds. So yeah, it, uh, whenever Xiaomi says, "Oh, we have a certain number of units available," uh, you know, it's still quite a struggle for most people to try and get hold of one, especially those um, outside China, anyway, because Xiaomi is still only available in kind of a the Asia countries. Now, it seems to me that uh, Xiaomi has out appled Apple in at least two respects here. The first is that they have glass on both front and back. Of course, Apple pioneered that with the Apple with the iPhone 4 line. I thought it was a really elegant idea, although they got a lot of criticism. And uh, you know what? It's three ways. The second way is that they, they're out thinning Apple. Apple said that basically there had to be a protruding camera on the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus because they just couldn't get the camera into the incredibly thin form factor. And here Xiaomi has come out with a thinner phone that has a flush camera. And the third thing is the lightness. They've, they've managed to become lighter than the iPhone, even though they've got glass front and back. So it sounds to me like, you know, this is an unusual, this is something that Samsung isn't often able to do. Samsung has many benefits that Apple doesn't have, that's true, but they don't do things that are the kinds of things that Apple would do better than Apple does them. And that's what I'm seeing in those three uh, cases. But are there other attributes of this? Is it really true that this is kind of a better Apple-like phone than the iPhone? Or are there problems with this phone that uh, the iPhone does not have? Well, let's look at. Uh, let's focus on the camera issue here. Uh, I've all, personally, I've always been baffled by how Apple thinks it's okay to have a protruding camera. I think for most people, they they're okay with it because they they use a case with a phone anyway. But I, I personally, I like to use my phones as is. Uh, but if you look at the specs, and if you look at the industry anyway, the uh, iPhone iPhone 6 still has one of the best camera performances out there. Not necessarily the best uh, camera specs, because if you look at numbers alone, you're not getting as many megapixels. But at the same time, we are looking at uh, 
a, a more efficient sensor on the iPhone, you still get a, a 1.5 micron pixels. That's pretty big. You know, the um, the bigger ones, uh, you only get that from uh, HTC's ultra pixel camera. Uh, whereas the, the main 13 megapixel camera on the uh, Mi Note, uh, they didn't actually mention this. You know, you should notice that on the on a Xiaomi spec sheet, they did not point out what the pixel size is on its uh, 30 megapixel camera. But they did point out that it's the second generation Sony uh, sensor. So I'm guessing we're still looking at one point, uh, no more than 1.2 microns, which is you know rather uh, common for most of the uh, 30 megapixel cameras you get on uh, the Android phones these days. So ultimately, we'll need to look at the sample images coming out of the Mi Note to determine whether, um, you know, they can actually uh, properly mock Apple for having a protruding camera. Now, Richard, um, in addition to this uh, phablet, uh, Xiaomi also announced uh, some new headphones and also a product called the Mi Box Mini. Very briefly, because we got to get you off to bed, uh, yeah. what are these products all about? The uh, So Xiaomi has also been releasing a series of TV, uh, Android powered TV boxes called the Mi Box. And this time they threw us a little surprise, which is the Mi Box Mini. So as you can tell from the name, it's a much, a very, very tiny version of an Android powered TV box. Well, I say box, it's more like a phone charger that you plug into a power socket. So when it's plugged in, you, you, you'd you actually think it's like a phone charger, but it doesn't charge up your phone. Instead, it has an eight port that lets you output 3D 1080p uh, video to your TV and you also get um, you know, millions of hours worth of video content uh, that you can stream if you're based in China but if you're not in China you would have to somehow sideload some apps onto that device which uh, according to uh, our fellow writers in Hong Kong who's who's in uh, Beijing right now, you are able to do that by remotely installing some apps onto this little device. So I think that's pretty neat. And it's only 30 US dollars, which is very, very compelling. So I'm sure it will sell like hotcake in China when it re releases later this month. As for those headphones, these are... Um, I actually don't know much about the headphones because I, I kind of have to try them on myself to see whether they're that good. But they are only... I don't know, I want to say 80 US dollars, I think, or 70 US dollars. So, um, and they come with a pair of 50 millimeter drivers and they look kind of good. I wouldn't say they're the prettiest headphones, but the whole point of the headphones is that they're meant to go with the hi-fi feature on the Mi Note because the Mi Note comes with some very uh, powerful amplifiers and high quality amplifiers to give you the uh, hi-fi audio experience. And that's okay. kind of something that a lot of Chinese um, phone manufacturers are doing these days, uh, which is to uh, incorporate these high quality uh, audio chips. So uh, it's good to see Xiaomi offering um, the same kind of uh, nice features while maintaining a similar price point. Yeah, but unfortunately, there is no Lady Gaga version like Apple's Beats. Well, Richard Lai is at Engadget.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Richard Lai, and he's coming to us from Beijing. Again, thanks for staying up late, and I mean, appreciate you coming I'm, on the show. I'm actually in Hong Kong right You're now. in Hong Kong. Okay, well, normally <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're far away at very late, so we appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. All right. Very quick update on the Google Glass um, uh, story that we told you about at the top of the show. It turns out that Tony Fadell, who used to be the CEO of Nest before it was acquired by Google, will run the, a separate division for Google Glass. It's no longer part of the, so I guess the Google X Labs uh, uh, division of Google. So they're uh, going official with it, and so we can look for uh, real, real products on the consumer marketplace at some time in the future. Well, in just a second, we're going to find out what Mark Zuckerberg is doing in South America. But first, I want to tell you about LegalZoom. LegalZoom is not a law firm. They're actually a self-help legal services company, uh, and you get to control what the legal services are and how you use them. In fact, I would recommend that you go to LegalZoom.com and just spend some quality time there looking at what they have available. Almost everybody has unmet legal needs. Uh, for example, if you are um, you know, over the age of 20 or 30, you should have a will or living trust 
Uh, there's all kinds of those types of things on LegalZoom that will remind you of the sorts of things that you need to sort of get your legal life in order, whether you're an individual person or especially if you own a business or you're thinking about starting a business, you know, launching a company, launching your own company is actually super easy to do with LegalZoom because they get rid of the expensive lawyers. They take away a lot of the time that it takes and just enable you to figure out what kind of corporation you want to a start, what type of company you want to have, and then to actually launch that company. They give you all the stuff you need to launch a company, including, you know, if you have technology, you can do trademark searches, you can do patent and copyright uh, type of work. It's really a fantastic service. So don't let another year pass you by before getting your life organized. For legal help you can count on for your family or small business, go to LegalZoom.com and use the offer code TNT, and that'll get you $10 off at checkout. Protect your family and protect your future at LegalZoom.com, and we thank LegalZoom for their support of Tech News Today. Well, Elise, what the heck is Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg doing in Colombia? Bogota, Colombia was the location for his first international town hall heard, uh, held earlier this week in which he did sort of have to address this question about why a company like Facebook, um, which is all about uh, free expression, does operate in countries that restrict free speech like Colombia. So joining us to talk about this is Ian Schur, executive editor of CNET. Ian, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for being with us. So um, how does Zuckerberg kind of play both sides of this, both be operating in Colombia and then kind of have to answer that question? Well, essentially what he's saying is what he said while he was there is that uh, Facebook has to walk this line between being accessible and uh, rallying for free speech. And so essentially what what it came down to is he said, look, you know, we're going to if we're not available in a country that is minimizing free speech, then the tools aren't there to help people. And the reality is that from his point of view, a protest where you take something offline and don't make it available because you decide to run afoul of the government and have it completely cut out, it, it, those aren't as, as, as effective as people who have the tools to be able to communicate and uh, kind of create a groundswell of change. So that was, that was his perspective on it all. You know, he, he said a lot of things that were actually really interesting. He addressed some of the more controversial points that uh, people have been talking about, including on this show, especially about freedom of expression and whether mm -hmm. CNET, you know, why CNET censors this or does that and so on. He, he basically said what CEOs said. You know, he did his best to say, oh, we're connecting everybody. We're a, we're a force for free expression in the world and so on. Uh, and didn't really go into the details of, of some of the things that they've done. Uh, but one of the interesting things he did say, which I thought was really fascinating, was that he said that Facebook's mobile app now uses 10% of the data that it did a year and a half ago. They've somehow slimmed it down so that it uses far less data. Yeah. Uh, what is he talking about there? Is it code? Is it... Is it, is it uh, uh, compression for videos and photographs. What is he talking about there? How did they do that? It's really actually interesting. Uh, uh, you know, it may have been just uh, magic fairy dust. It's really hard to tell. Uh, when you consider what they've been doing, they've actually been growing the capabilities of the Facebook app more and more. It now does uh, video automatically, right? When you're scrolling through the app, it actually starts playing video. So it's really interesting. I, I'm not really sure how they do it, but uh, one of the things that you can always be sure of is that um, a lot of the things that can happen behind the scenes with the way that an app communicates with servers, a way that a computer um, even just creates the images in the phone, all that type of stuff can really slim down and there's always an opportunity. So that's probably what he was talking about. One of the interesting things that Facebook has been doing lately is that they actually built a lab. They've talked about this before, but he brought it up yesterday. They built this lab where they simulate what the internet connections are like in other countries. And what Zuckerberg said is that he, he wants his engineers to feel empathy or to, to really understand how it is for other people in other countries. Um, Facebook has mentioned before that they actually have their engineers use uh, lower end or, or you know, what we would consider just pretty bad uh, smartphones um, just to know what it's like for their users because you know, 1.3 billion people uh, that's a lot more than just the rich Western world. And uh, it seems to be having an impact. You know, they're designing their apps, it seems at least, um, with a lot more of that in mind. And it's something, you know, it, it seems like Facebook itself is being reoriented around this internet.org initiative. And, uh, you know, he wants to be able to make it so that you can have free basic internet anywhere you are. 
And uh, one of the ways that they need to do that is make Facebook a very lightweight app, even though they're showing you more photos and more videos every day. So it seems like they're doing it. And Ian, that's what I was going to ask you about this internet.org getting the next billion online um, mm -hmm. uh, effort. How is that going so far? Give us a little bit of a progress report because we know Zuckerberg was in Colombia too uh, under the auspices of this effort. Yeah, they've been able to make a number of, pro of partnerships. Uh, he's been in Africa. He was in Colombia yesterday. Uh, there's definitely some stuff that they've been able to do. And part of the hard part, of you, as you can imagine, is setting these agreements in the first place, really getting the government on board and then getting the telecoms on board. Part of what he's doing is, and he was actually asked this yesterday, why don't you try and make it that there's free internet for everyone all around the world? And he said, look, the, the best that we can hope for is basic internet, basic connections to stuff like Facebook or WhatsApp or these kind of very basic communication services. Uh, he mentioned that the agreement that he struck in Colombia also includes an app on a phone that helps with learning how medical stuff is going. So if you're worried about you know, a condition that you might have, you can actually look it up on your phone for free, no internet connection, quotes, costs involved. And he said, but the, the higher end internet, right, the, the normal internet that you and I surf every day, that stuff has to be paid for somehow. And he said, you know, it's not just enough for the government to pay for it. It's not just enough for the telecoms to agree to do this. But, uh, you know, normal people have to get involved because it costs billions of dollars to create the infrastructure. But he said on a very basic level, if you give people a taste of what the internet is, he said the part of the problem is that most people, you know, who haven't been on the internet yet, and it's hard to imagine our lives without it, but those who haven't been on the internet yet really don't understand what it can do for them. And so he said giving them a little taste of what it can do will really help them understand why it's valuable in their lives, and then hopefully they would pay uh, for a better connection later. And that's, that's part of what internet.org is is making the argument to these telecom companies all around the world with. Fascinating. I think that uh, the most important thing for Facebook is to make sure that core data gets through, namely Facebook ads. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, you know, the more they use the Internet, they're like Google. The more they use the Internet, the more those companies uh, like them. So uh, yeah. the Google has a similar program that they're doing as well. Ian Share is at CNET.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Ian Share. Thanks for joining us, Ian. My pleasure. As we mentioned yesterday during an interview with CNET's Tim Stevens on our other news program, Tech News Tonight, Google is talking to car makers about working with the Silicon Valley giant on self-driving cars. Will Oramus is a senior technology writer at Slate and joins us to talk about this. How are you doing, Will? Great. Thanks, Mike. Now, which car companies is Google talking to exactly? The ones that it named to Reuters yesterday were Ford, GM, Toyota, Daimler, and Volkswagen. So does Google want to build its own self-driving cars or do they want the car companies to do it with Google technology? That's the big question. So a few years ago when Google first announced its self-driving car project, it sort of seemed like a novelty. I mean, the automakers didn't laugh publicly, but behind the scenes they might have been laughing. Now nobody's laughing. This is becoming a big business. Um, whether we get to full autonomy in cars or not, whether we get to the point where a car can drive itself without you in it, that's still an open question, I think. But we're absolutely moving in the direction of autonomous vehicles. And a, a whole industry is springing up around it. The automakers are taking notice. Uh, at the Consumer Electronics uh, Show in Las Vegas earlier this month, all the automakers were there. All the automakers were talking about their efforts to build automation into cars, whether it's, you know, for now it's like uh, parallel parking assistance, it's adaptive cruise control where the car can speed up and slow down while you're on the highway automatically. Um, but uh, the push is toward fully self-driving cars. Google has led the way technologically. And now the question is, do the automakers partner with Google and use its technology uh, and vice versa. Does Google want to partner with the automakers or go it alone? I think ultimately both sides will find that it's in their best interests to work together, but they're not quite ready to jump into that right now. Their visions of the future are a little different at this point. Now, we learned this week that Google's partnering with a variety of suppliers, mostly in Detroit, uh, to build its prototype self-driving car, the one that we've seen on YouTube, uh, including a company called Ro Roosh. Uh, who else is involved? And I, I guess the question is, how does a search engine company go about building a car uh, to prototype their self-driving technology? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, they're working with Roush, uh, which is a Detroit area. It's a it's a, a major automotive company. It doesn't make its own cars for the most part, but it has uh, it's very involved in automobile automobile racing industry. Um, and uh, so what we learned is that Google is working with Roush to build those first prototypes, uh, those cars you've seen and that you showed on the screen, those little pods uh, where there's not even a steering wheel. Uh, and Roush is now working to build a small fleet of those prototypes uh, in the coming year. So so for now. Google is working with Roush. It's working with other automotive suppliers, uh, Continental. Um, it's working with LG. It's working with a bunch of companies to build its prototypes. And then the question will be, what happens when it actually wants to bring these things to market? Um, Chris Ermson, who's the director of Google's self-driving car project, uh, said recently that he really thinks these cars, self-driving cars, will be on the road by 2020. I don't think Google is going to build its own assembly lines. It's not going to be, uh, you know, the next Tesla. Um, that's just not its strength. I mean, you know, mass production of hardware is not what Google do, does best. Ultimately, I think they'll be partnering with major automakers probably to bring it to market. But we don't know yet who. We don't know if it'll be exclusive. We don't know what exactly everybody's role will be. Will Oramus writes at Slate.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Will Oramus. Thanks for joining us today, Will. Thanks for having me. Now, at least the uh, United States and the UK have what is often described as a special relationship. But <laughs> is it special enough for what the UK's prime minister wants from President Obama? And I don't know that Obama really has the power to do what Prime Minister David Cameron wants. He essentially is calling for Obama to support um, an anti-encryption proposal. Uh, he wants uh, the US government to essentially call out tech companies uh, that provide communications that can't be unscrambled. Uh, he wants tech companies essentially to cooperate with UK intelligence to help them, quote, give no safe space for terrorists to organize. This is a very interesting position in the wake of an attack on free expression since it's essentially saying we don't want to give you one channel for free expression in order to protect ourselves from attacks over free expression. I'm kind of astonished that he publicly said that he wants this because he's not <laughs> going to get it. I mean, you know, there, of course, Americans are sort of free speech absolutists, uh, fortunately. Uh, I'm one of those free speech absolutist Americans. And, you know, just politically, it's death for Obama to call for this kind of thing. And I think it's, you know, I don't think Cameron is going to get reelected, frankly, partly because of this <laughs> kind of proposal. I mean, it, it, this is the best reason I've heard to not vote for the conservatives in uh, in the U.K., and it's and so I just think it's it's crazy. He seems desperate and he seems to be trying lots of crazy stuff like this. And he should you know, he should have called first and said, hey, you know, uh, how about if I go public and say that I want you to support this uh, this idea of basically ending encrypted communication? Uh, because I'm pretty sure the president would have said, hell no, that's not going to happen. But this goes into kind of an interesting place with diplomacy these days um, in a time of cyber terror because a lot of uh, these communications are essentially controlled by private companies and yet nation states are trying to do something about it. And so the extent to which governments have control over private companies is, I feel, overestimated, at least in, in terms of American uh, government having control over American private companies. Yeah, exactly. Well, in other news, New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman proposed a new data security law for the state, which he's calling the strongest in the country. Christy Smythe is a legal reporter for Bloomberg, and she joins us now to talk about the story. How are you doing, Christy? Hi, good. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Now, can you outline Schneiderman's proposal for us? Uh, this, this is a, a really interesting proposal, especially in the wake of President Obama's nas nationwide proposal that kind of covers similar ground. Sure. Um, right now, protection of consumer data is governed generally by a patchwork of state and federal laws, and there isn't really a uh, generally applicable federal law uh, for protecting data other than for uh, certain types of industry-specific information, like in healthcare. Uh, and state laws are often restricted to very narrow definitions of personal information to, uh, to trigger the actual requirements to notify consumers or authorities. And those are usually uh, social security numbers, um, actual credit card information, and other kind of and, and combinations of data. Um, not necessarily login information for online accounts. Um, the New York Attorney General's bill, or what he's proposing, would um, greatly broaden the definition of personal information that would be covered by the law to include the types of things you need to log into your online accounts, like emails and passwords or security questions. Um, he's also proposing kind of a general requirement the companies that operate in the state safeguard data. 
uh, and that's um, more uh, more restrictive than uh, many of the state laws that already exist. Christy, this is interesting because it comes the same week that President Obama put out his proposal for a data, uh, federal data privacy um, or protection act. Um, how would this work? So essentially, wouldn't a and one of the complaints about this federal proposal was that it was less strong or not as strong as a lot of state measures. And so, if a federal act were to be enacted, then um, would it essentially override a lot of the uh, this particular New York proposal and and other state proposals? Well, not necessarily if it's not as strong as the state proposals. I think generally there's a history if the state law is stronger than the federal law, the state law would, would govern in many cases. Uh, attorneys general, this is a, a very core area for them. This is an area that's one of their kind of um, their, their hard their areas where they're kind of hitting hard on companies and making sure they're doing the right thing. Um, they've been the major enforcers of data protection. So they want to still be able to do that. I'm sure that um, as discussions continue over the federal law, I wouldn't be surprised if they would be uh, voicing opinions and making sure that they can still uh, protect what they need to do. You can read Christy Smythe at Bloomberg.com and you can follow her on Twitter at Christy Smythe. Smythe is spelled S-M-Y-T-H-E. Thank you for joining us, Christy. Thank you for having me. All right. In just a sec, we've got some uh, some TNT fan email, but first I want to tell you about ZipRecruiter. One of the differences between successful companies and unsuccessful companies is the quality of the people that each hires. You want to hire the very best people, and the way you do that is you find them wherever they are, and you never know where they are, and that's where ZipRecruiter is going to come in handy because they're going to let you post your job to 50 plus job sites with just a single click. These are job sites like Bright, like Jobs to Careers, eBay Classifieds, LinkedIn, Monster, Craigslist, all the major ones, lots of minor ones, and it includes social networks like Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, and Twitter. You can find candidates in any industry in any city across the nation. Super easy to do. You can screen candidates, rate them, and hire them fast. And most importantly, you'll hire the very best person because you'll have the very best search. ZipRecruiter has been used by more than 250,000 businesses, and they have their own gigantic resume database with over 5 million resumes, and they add thousands of new resumes every single day. So if you search their resume database yesterday, search it again. There's thousands more in there that you're going to want to check out. Right now, uh, TNT fans can try ZipRecruiter. For a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of tech news today. We got some email from a TNT fan named Luther Miller who said, I listen to the show almost every day, and would you consider doing a show on the instability of custom keyboards in iOS? I use SwiftKey daily and experience almost all of the issues in the Reddit article below. He sent a link to a Reddit article multiple times a day, and I'm amazed Apple would release something so buggy. I've heard complaints like this before, and, uh, and, and it's really kind of interesting. If you are uh, using uh, SwiftKey or any sort of uh, third-party keyboard, which is, you know, of course, a new thing for the iOS platform, let us know. Let us know if it's working for you or if it isn't working for you. Uh, if you're experiencing the same kind of problems that Luther Miller is, we want to know. And if you're not, we also want to know. So please send that to tnt at twit.tv. Well, in other news, a PC mod enthusiast named Eddie Zarek has created the Ultimate Game Console. It's a portable laptop that functions as both an Xbox One and a PlayStation 4. His Playbox clamshell design includes a 22-inch 1080p screen. Uh, at least, Hugh, I really don't have time to play console video games, unfortunately. I wish I did. But if I was into it, I would really want one of these. Basically, what he did is he built this for a paying customer. So this isn't just for his own use. Uh, somebody sort of commissioned this, and he's produced other mobile game console uh, sort of mods that he's sold at sort of, you know, not high volumes, but, you know, at reasonable numbers. But how beautiful is this? It's just an amazing product. I love I love all this uh, design creativity and ingenuity. Yeah, me too. And, and you know, we looked uh, yesterday at, on TN2 at a, uh, somebody did a, a sort of a modern take on the original Mac and that was a beautiful thing. Check out yesterday's TN2 if, if you haven't seen that. It's just an amazing thing. And I, I, I love it to see people doing this kind of thing. Well, a shoot 'em up parody video game with North Korean dictator Kim Jong un as the main character has been canceled after the developer was hacked. The developer is called Money Horse Games. 
The company tried to crowdsource the game called Glorious Leader on Kickstarter. Uh, they raised only $16,800 of their $55,000 goal. The breach involved a Sony Pictures-like erasing of data, but Money Horse Games said in a statement they have no reason to believe the hack was carried out by the Guardians of Peace group that hit Sony. Security experts, meanwhile, are publicly doubting the hacking justification for the cancellation of the game, saying that it's unlikely that a game company wouldn't have backups, and that's a good point. Uh, it seems to me that, like they failed in their Kickstarter goal and kind of looking for a, uh, a, a some justification other than failure <laughs> as to why they're not coming out with a game that lots of people were talking about. Yeah, maybe it just wasn't good. Yeah, maybe it wasn't, although the video looked really good. It's uh, had uh, Kim Jong-un running around shooting things with a sort of flamethrower and stuff like that, so that looked uh, pretty cool. Well, we've reported many times about Google's modular phone initiative called Project Aura. Google yesterday gave a few details about its pilot program for distributing the first prototype phones to be made available to the public in the second half of this year. The two most interesting details are that the pilot program will begin in Puerto Rico and that the distribution outlet will be a fleet of food trucks. Google says Puerto Rico was selected for its diverse mobile user base and free trade zones. So there you have it, folks. If you want to find the future of modular smartphones, you're going to have to find it in a food truck in Puerto Rico. This is real, uh, at least here, this is a real out-of-the-box thinking here. Um, I have the feeling that a lot of our fans, a lot of TNT fans, are going to make a pilgrimage to Puerto Rico when this thing uh, hits the food trucks there. Yeah, I mean, this is a great story. I would want to go to Puerto Rico to do this piece. So. Yeah, yeah, also they have food trucks in Puerto Rico that have food, which is uh, <laughs> often very, very good. So we look for those as well. Well, our TNT fan of the day is David McKay in Germany, who posted this picture on Google+. David said he loves the show and he watches in his man cave. There you go. If you click on that, Jason, that is a... Uh, oh, hey, it's us. It's us. So if you can, I think you can scroll around and, oh, that's not a, oh, that's right. It's not a, uh, one of those, what do they call it? Photosphere. It's not a photosphere. Uh, but an incredible simulation. But yeah, there we are. He, I guess he has each of us on each screen. I don't know how he's doing that. <laughs> I don't know how he's doing that either. <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, how do you watch uh, TNT? We want to see a picture or a video. Just take a picture and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. That is the tech news today. Elise Hugh. What have you been working on these days? Oh, I've been working on moving. Yeah. Um, but tonight on NPR is all things considered our afternoon program. You can hear a seven and a half minute piece from me about Tony Shea uh, of Zappos.com fame and his downtown project and how that's going three years in. And of course, I'm still on Twitter at Elise WHO. Wonderful. I look forward to listening to that. And by the way, when are you moving exactly? It is unclear, but in the next few weeks ish. All right, and you're moving to Seoul, Korea, and you're going to be the uh, the bureau chief for the Seoul Bureau. Is that correct? The Seoul, Seoul Bureau Chief. All right, a little bit of rhythm and a lot of soul. Thank you so much. We will see you next time. Great, thanks. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today, and you should subscribe to Tech News Today. Uh, RSS is a great choice. It's uh, an old standard. Uh, you can uh, check that out or subscribe in some other way at twit.tv slash TNT, which is our URL. You can also follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Join our Google Plus community. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find all our stuff there. And please send us your thoughts and opinions to TNT at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. Don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name is Mike Elgin. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.